All right, so this is a screencast of a lecture. I'm going to go over some basic stuff about uh, AP government that uh, you guys should know. So we're going to start off with theories of democratic government. Now, <clears throat> on your you, your um, review packet, uh, there's four theories. I'm going to look at one, the traditional theory, and then we'll look at the three theories of American democracy. So we'll start off with the traditional theory. Traditional theory is, is um, really there's two basic models. You can see here we've got direct democracy and representative or republic or indirect democracy. Uh, best example of a direct democracy, of course, is Athenian democracy, the idea that every citizen has a say on every issue. So every citizen votes on everything. In a representative democracy or a republic or indirect democracy, like we had during the Roman Republic or here in the United States, uh, we elect people as representatives and they do the work for us. So those are the two basic models for democratic governments. Now, in order for them to be democratic, there are five basic criteria. Uh, equality in voting, the idea that one person, one vote. The idea is that uh, your vote doesn't count any more or any less than anyone else's. So your parents don't get a vote more often than you do, or their vote doesn't count more than yours just because they're older. Or mine doesn't count just because I'm a social studies teacher. Or the president's doesn't count more just because he's the president, or someday she's the president. Uh, equality in voting also means that um, that that it must be extended to to many, but it doesn't have to be available to all. Um, the second thing is effective participation. Uh, here is the idea that uh, citizens must have the ability to participate in different ways. They cannot be prevented from engagement. Um, this is more than just voting, of course. It includes all the different ways for, for participation in a democratic society. All the ways that we've talked about before, including uh, lobbying, um, getting involved in litigation, campaigning, electioneering, protests, and the like. The third thing that needs to happen is enlightened understanding. Uh, this is the idea that citizens, it's their responsibility to be aware of what's going on in the government, <clears throat> and to do something about that. Uh, this is also where the news media plays an important role to help with this enlightened understanding. Fourth is citizens control of the agenda. Well, by and large, uh, the agenda is set by people in power. We elect them and we can shift and control the focus um, by participating, by understanding by having equality in voting. And last of all, inclusion. Um, no one can be excluded. And this links back to this thing up here, this idea of majority rules and minority rights. The idea that, <clears throat> yes, the government will operate based on what most of the people want. But that doesn't mean that minorities, not minority groups, but my more minority opinions are left out. In fact, those opinions are very important and are um, protected through things like freedom of speech. One can be critical of the majority and still um, and still be a citizen because in all likelihood at some point uh, those in the minority might one day be in the majority and vice versa. So those are the, those are the kind of the parts of the theory of democratic government, the traditional theory of democratic government. Now let's look at the three theories on American democratic government. Uh, the first one is the elitist theory. The idea here is that society is divided along class lines, um, and that this is like an aristocracy. And the aristocracy, which is based on wealth, um, is in control. The wealthy set the agenda. The wealthy have the power. The wealthy are the ones who um, who participate. They lock everybody else out. So under the elitist theory, all these criteria effectively are um, eliminated, but especially this fourth one and um, somewhat the fifth one, inclusion. <clears throat> Your next uh, theory is the pluralist theory. This is the idea that uh, groups with shared interests, which 
uh, sometimes they're called policy networks, can influence and push their agenda. And this is because in a democracy there's open access to those in power. Um, this, this leads to the ability that no one group or groups dominates the agenda. So when, if you think back to what uh, James Madison wrote in Federalist 51 and 10 about the good side of factions, it prevents one person or persons or groups from gaining too much power because everyone is divided. So the pluralist theory is linked to Madison's idea of factionalism. And then you have the hyper-pluralist theory. This is pluralism taken to the nth degree, pluralism gone sour, pluralism gone bad. Um, interest groups are so strong, there are so many interest groups, that government is actually unable to operate. It's too weak or too I ineffective uh, because there's just too much input from these groups. So you've essentially got stalemate because nothing can get done because all that's happening is interest group pressure and pushing and controlling the agenda. So those are the basic theories of American government. Next, let's uh, do a quick review on federalism. So federalism uh, is division and sharing of power between national or central um, government and the state governments or local governments. In the United States, it's between the national government and the state governments. In other places, it's between the central government, whatever that might be, and local governments. In some cases, it's a state government. In some cases, it's a province, uh, whatever the term is. And there are three basic systems that you need to be aware of uh, with regard to federalism. Uh, you should be aware of the unitary system, the confederal system, and of course, federalism. So first of all, let's go to not that one. Here we go. Let's go to this. So, on the far left, <clears throat> with regard to political systems, uh, you've got the unitary system. In a unitary system, you've got a strong central government, which is represented right here. And then you've got a series of local governments. The central government has all the power. The central government sets the agenda. The central government gives powers to these local governments. 90% uh, of the world operates under a unitary system. Some of the best examples include the United Kingdom and China. Okay, So this is the system that most of the world operates. In, in the UK, um, the local towns and counties and whatnot only have power because the government gives them that power. On the other end, you've got a confederal system right here. So all these circles around the edges, those are the state or local governments, and they have all the power. They have the power to tax, they have the power to, to do this and do that, and they give power to the central government in the middle. So the central government is small, it's weak, it's ineffective in most cases. Um, and we've seen this in a couple situations. We've seen it here in the United States at least twice um, under the Articles of Confederation and the Confederate States of America. We've also seen it uh, here in North America with the Iroquois League. And it is most often seen today in international agencies like the European Union and the United Nations. Uh, the UN does not have its own peacekeeping force uh, that it can draw upon. It relies upon soldiers being provided by the nation states that are its members. Okay, uh, European Union is another example, uh, especially we've seen this with regard to their financial situation in the recent years. And then last of all, we've got the federalist system, where you've got a state government and a uh, national government have some shared responsibilities and interest. Okay, <clears throat> so federalism, let's zoom out. Spectrum wise, you've got unitary system, federalism, and confederalism. There are only about a dozen states or nations in the world today that use the federalism system. None that I can think of that use confederal except international agencies, and everybody else uses a unitary system. 
The only other thing I can think of you should know about federalism is the difference between dual federalism and cooperative federalism. Dual federalism is layer cake federalism, the idea that uh, they're separate powers, separate realms, separate agencies. Uh, they <clears throat> they are connected, but not they don't interact, they don't work together. Cooperative is marble cake uh, federalism, the idea that there are some overlapping areas of interest and that, that these areas of interest are things that they have to work together and share responsibility for. Uh, at this point, the only th other thing you really need to know about is as you're writing your Federalist paper, do not forget this. Uh, the issue that you're looking at has to do with this division and sharing of power. Uh, you're looking at whatever the issue is with regard to federalism, with regard to the division and sharing power between the national government and the state government. Whether that's a conflict, <clears throat> they're actually sharing something, um, it's really more of a state issue versus a national issue, or vice versa. So, that's a quick little overview of theories of democratic government and federalism. Uh, if you stick around and watch the next video, you'll see me get into a little bit about federalism and the Constitution, and then the early constitutional powers.